So it is my honor to introduce uh, Ikomali, eh, who is uh, uh, associated professor at the University of Tilburg in the Netherlands, and who, he has a long-standing interest in discourse studies and ethnography. His discourse analyses and reflections on anti-enlightenment ideologies, Flemish nationalism and the new right have been bestsellers in Dutch. His Dutch and English language publications focus on the impact of digitalization processes on politics and activism. He thereby, de thereby develops a historic, discursive and digital ethnographic approach for analyzing the use of digital media by new right movements and politicians. His teachings at the University of Tilburg uh, focus on digital media and politics, but also on digital ethnography and social groups in the digital world. Since the publication of his uh, book, uh, Nieuw Rex, uh, which is Dutch for the New Right, um, he has become a widely acclaimed and consulted expert on the New Right in Belgium and the Netherlands. Ikomali is connected to the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, uh, as an expert advisor on new right radicalization. He is also editor-in-chief of Digit magazine, an online initiative dedicated to the study of digital culture, globalization, art and politics. Now, for all of these reasons, I would like to thank Iko for his willingness to present part of his work at this conference. And I now gladly give the floor to my friend and colleague who will open the scientific part of this event by talking to you about algorithmic politics and the study of propaganda in times of digital media. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jan, for this <laughs> generous uh, introduction. Um, well, today in Rita, I want to talk about algorithmic politics and you immediately wonder what that has to do with uh, propaganda. And I hope that I make that point uh, throughout uh, my lecture uh, in the sense that um, I think and I will argue that we have arrived in a time where algorithms are at least partially shaping politics and political discourse in particular. Um, I will talk about what I call algorithmic populism and algorithmic activism uh, in uh, more detail uh, later on. Now, Jan, um, well, uh, said that I work a lot around ideology, uh, around um, anti-enlightenment, the new right and so on. I, I will bring you a case of uh, what I would see as new right politicians uh, in uh, Flanders, Flemish interest, uh, but I will not say a lot about ideology today. Uh, and of course, that does not mean that that is not important. On the contrary, I'm, ideology is of key importance when uh, discussing politics, of course. Uh, but today, uh, especially for this conference, I would like to focus on, on well, the newness, uh, on the impact of digitalization on uh, politics. Um, so I hope you don't mind, but I, I thought that that would be, uh, well, the new stuff that I could bring in uh, here. Uh, maybe one addition to the introduction of Jan, uh, and then I'll move over to, uh, well, the more theoretical part and the methodological part of uh, my lecture, is that, uh, of course, like everyone, I'm speaking from a very specific uh, position. And in my case, I'm a culture studies scholar. Uh, I work at the Department of Culture Studies at the University of Tilburg, uh, and there we, we work around culture studies, but in a very particular way. Uh, we focus on the impact of digitalization, and uh, we are engaged in what we would call digital culture studies, and that will, of course, explain some of my uh, topics, my biases in the lecture that uh, is here to come. Uh, so, that is the personal stuff. Uh, I also would like to share some of the assumptions that I take with me, that I start this lecture with. And the first one would be uh, that we today live in a post-digital era. And of course, post-digital, not in the sense that digitalization is not real anymore, or is not a real fact, factory uh, uh, that we need to take in account. On the contrary, of course. Uh, uh, I take the term from uh, Florian Kramer, who says, well, the we live in a post-digital era. Why? Well, because of the fact that the digital revolution has already occurred, that the revolutionary part is there and that digital media and digitalization is now a normal part of our lives. And I think uh, if we have learned something uh, as a result of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, 
is that that has been accelerated. We are now here joined together in one of the most old uh, uh, formats of academic uh, talk, the conference but we do not share space and time. I'm standing in Ghent and I assume that people from all over the world are now logging in and seeing what I can do. Media organizes our communication or at least facilitates uh, our communication right now. And in a rapid extent, we see that digitalization becomes a normal part of our lives. And as discourse analysts, we should of course, uh, well, <laughs> Learn, have the lesson of Roland Barthes in our mind that from the moment something is normal, we tend to overlook it. We tend to uh, not see the powerfulness of uh, that normality. And I think that is uh, something that I would want to draw attention to in uh, my lecture. I think that digitalization and the normality of digitalization, uh, well, deserves our attention deserves our research uh, endeavor in uh, well the next uh, years and so on. And you immediately, uh, here we arrive at my second assumption. Uh, lots of scholars look at media as if there are just instruments that facilitate communication, as if nothing changes uh, when we have a conference uh, through uh, digital media, as if nothing changes. Well, I tend to disagree. The second assumption is, of course, that media and new media always have effects on society. They change society. And that, of course, becomes very clear uh, from the moment we look at uh, the different uh, interactive forms. Maybe some people have read uh, the seminal book of G.B. Thompson in the 90s on media and modernity, uh, where he made uh, the argument uh, that uh, there were three modes of interaction face-to-face -face, uh, interaction, mediated interaction, the telephone call, mediated quasi-interaction, broadcasting, media change communication. That was the argument. Mediated communication changed face-to-face -face communication because of the compression of space-time. Mediated quasi-interaction, broadcasting, uh, changed our interaction because we could now talk and have all the visual cues, but nobody could talk back. A bit like today, in the sense that even though we use uh, computers uh, to set up this conference, something has changed. If you would have this talk face to face, you could interrupt me every minute of uh, my lecture. Today, Cedric behind the screens organizes the fact that you can ask questions, but I cannot see them uh, right now. I will get the questions later on. Something has changed. And G.B. Thompson wrote an update of his seminal work now in 2020, saying, well, there is a, a fourth uh, interactive uh, mode, and that is mediated online interaction. He used to call it mediated computer interaction. Uh, but the point is that we now live in a time in which all of us can broadcast. We get, we have seen the democratization of transmission and people can now write blogs, vlogs, use social media and so on uh, to become part of the public flow. And that was his argument that has fundamental changes in the political field, in the media field. We see today different information flows we have different social infrastructures. It's not just mainstream media anymore, but it's also Facebook, it's also YouTube, it is Google and so on and so on. All these players now matter in the political field. And one of the reasons is of course that they shape and enable different social relationships. If you now look at uh, how the extreme right is organizing itself, well, almost each communication, each action has a global dimension to it, which is interesting, of course, but because most of those um, movements are still nationalistic or regional uh, in uh, uptake and in focus, uh, but the organization, the interaction is global. They use global media platforms to organize global action for national goals. So what we see happening is that the digital era disrupts the media and the political field. And of course, digital media do not replace uh, the, the existing media field, but they change it. Chadwick calls this the hybrid media system. And he makes the argument that we, that digital media and the rise of digital media have changed the media field and created 
a chaotic transition period. We are now living in times of hybridization and the distinction between all the new media, non-digital and digital media has become very blurry. The time where you were a subscriber to the New York Times and that the mailman brought that in your mailbox in the morning has been gone. The New York Times is also there online, but it is also using Facebook, Instagram and so on. CNN collaborates with Facebook uh, for the transmission of uh, the of the presidential uh, debates. So what we see happening is a new media form, a new media field where we see new media logics uh, operating. It is different to talk on Twitter, on Instagram than it is in a talk show on uh, mass media. We see new affordances, new enabling new actors becoming part of uh, the political uh, discussion. And we also see new discursive practices. One is, for instance, dual screening. People watching at the presidential debate, but at the same time follow a hashtag on Twitter to get more information, uh, even join the conversation there. And that stuff matters. We know from research that uh, people who follow hashtags on Twitter while watching the debate, that they are influenced on the meaning that debate, uh, of the meaning they attribute to that debate. So discursive practices matter, and the changes matter. And of course, those changes in the media field of course have to the effect that politicians and media professionals cannot not adapt. Those changes are so profound that not adapting means marginalizing yourself. The argument that I'm going to make today is that the same is true for discourse analysts and anyone interested in propaganda. We focus propaganda. If we focus on propaganda and political discourse, content is of course important. Ideology is important. It is crucial, but it's not the only thing. Not just content should be the focus of our attention, but also the systems of communication and how they shape social linguistic conditions of production, circulation and the uptake of discourse. Post-digital environments are new social linguistic environments. Technology changes society and technology is context it's part of the meaning it's affecting contemporary discourse and in that sense it should be at the heart of our uh, focus not just ideology but also context technology and a form uh, that it gives to discourse Wilhelms already long ago said that meaning is as much an effect of discursive shape as it is of discursive content and that is something that is explicitly true today. And clickbait uh, probably is the best thing that reminds us about that. We are not just clicking about the content there, but we are also clicking about the form, the image that is connected to it, uh, the, the words uh, and the form of the words, uh, the, the fact that capitals are used and so on and so on. Uh, so that is the general argument of my lecture today. And I follow here my the colleague Jan Blomart, of course, at Tilburg, who argued uh, not long ago that as a result of those changes in the media field, uh, that we should revisit traditional models of propaganda, and more in particular, the model of uh, uh, Chomsky and Hermann, of course. Uh, why? Well, he argues that those models assume linear communication from one politician to the masses. They assume a media field that is still dominated always by legacy media and they assume a shared public sphere. Now, the whole idea of media at the time, the old broadcasting media before the, digital, the rise of digital media was grounded in a social scientific epistemology, better known as opinion research. The idea that we could study certain target groups where people had uh, are gathered with different genders, different class and so on. And as a result of that, could construct political discourse, uh, build a uh, uh, a, a platform for the election of a politician or, uh, on the other hand, uh, produce television programs that score uh, that lots of viewers are interested in, well, that times has, to a large extent, has gone. Iko, Jesus, can I interrupt yeah. you for a moment? Uh, yes. It seems like uh, your slides are not changing in... Yeah, that's, uh, that's okay. 
Okay, okay. I was just, uh, I was just wondering if, uh, if you were going to our slides or not. We got some questions about this. I'm sorry for the interruption. No worries. Slides will come from the moment I'll uh, dive into the data. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> no worries. So uh, the point is that those assumptions do not hold anymore. Okay. Today we witness a more fragmented media sphere. We see different platforms, we see the democratization of transmissions, uh, we see many different users being active. Huh? On the one hand, we see humans, we, common people, activists, uh, and so on, interacting with uh, posts of politicians, but we see also non-humans, click farms, uh, bots, uh, and so on, and so on. Now, as a result of the combination of all that stuff, we see a fragmentation of the audience. Okay. We see linear and synchronic communication being replaced by algorithmically organized interaction. If you tweet something, the other side will only see it through mediation of the algorithms of Twitter. It, will, it is Twitter that will decide if somebody else sees your tweet and it will take into account uh, human and non-human activity as proxies of relevance. How many clicks, likes, shares uh, you have, and on the basis of that, it will be shown. It is not linear communication anymore. There's also no single producer of discourse anymore. People retweeting, rep not just reproduce the same discourse, but contextualize it, produce, take it out of one context and bring it in a very different context, addressing new people and so on. Political discourse is constantly in motion today. To wrap up the argument, what we see happening is that contemporary politics and there's also propaganda follow, as Gillespie calls it, an algorithmic logic. And that means, of course, that studying politics, propaganda, political discourse cannot just focus on text. Should focus on the relationship between politics, ideology, and discourse in relation to human, non human audiences and media, digital media in uh, particular. Algorithms organize political discourse today. They are not just intermediators, but they have algorithmic agency. From the bots over the algorithms organizing the communication on a platform, they have an active role. They affect the input the uptake and the circulation of discourse. What do I mean with uptake? Uh, I refer to the fact that one, within a digital ecology, users are not only consumers, but also reproducers of discourse, so-called prosumers. And two, that algorithms and interfaces of digital media play an important role in the dissemination and reproduction of ideas. You will only see a post if people interact with it. And being seen is, of course, crucial. The management of visibility is crucial for politics. Now, as a result of that, and the result of the importance of uptake, you see new types of activism uh, occurring. Uh, I call that algorithmic activism. And we see that that has become a key component of contemporary discourse. We see it in the use of bots, click fund, but also in the use of people being very active fans of a certain politician, starting to like and share it uh, very fastly after uh, the politician has uh, posted something. It refers to the fact that activists not only subscribe to the message, to the discourse they interact with, or are not agreeing with it and interact with it, but also understand the affordances and the algorithmic construction of the media, that they have algorithmic knowledge or algorithmic imagination, as Butcher called it, that they know that sharing within the first minute on Facebook and liking it will have an effect on the visibility of that post and in that sense helps uh, the politician to gain uh, visibility. Algorithmic activists use theoretical, they have read about it, or practical knowledge, uh, they have seen what works, uh, about the relative weight certain signals have. What does a click mean in Facebook and what does time and a click mean in Facebook? And as a result of uh, that knowledge, they help a politician, a movement and, and so on. That is the uptake part. But digital media also infect the input. A message is not just distributed, but also shaped and altered by digital media. And it's quite evident that we should avoid uh, what Thompson calls the fallacy of internalism, the idea that 
a text in itself, that meaning is to be found in that text itself, that a text becomes popular because the meaning it carries. Well, there's more to it than that. A tweet will only be popular if there is very fast interaction, if people make it trending or bots make it trending. A tweet will then be posted on a certain hour of which the politician knows uh, that his audience is out there, but it will also have a certain limit of words that are there. It will use hashtags or not and so on and so on. So you see that digital media produce a certain type of discourse, at least co-construct a certain type of discourse. And same thing of course on YouTube. Huh? If you have a YouTube movie, well, you need to use search engine optimization. You need to know the relevance of meta tags in order to be found. So digital media reshape, shape, reorganize the communicative structure of the input, input discourse as well. And as a result of both uh, the relation of uptake and the design and the designing of the uh, input of discourse, we see that digital media affect the circulation the circulation of discourse through uh, the digital ecology, but also uh, larger to the hybrid media system in uh, general. How? Well, by selecting and prioritizing certain content, by algorithmically translating user activity. A tweet get lots of interactions and shares, it will become visible. And immediately you see that in contemporary digital times, that to manage visibility means to understand digital media understand the algorithms and to develop certain discursive practices uh, that lets one discourse uh, dominate in the hybrid media field. And that is what I label as algorithmic politics, uh, a new uh, time where one focuses not only on the construction of discourse and ideology, which is of course still uh, cru of crucial importance, but also on the uptake through human and non-human actors. And we see that this today is crucial for any political and meta-political uh, project. Without that uptake, there's no visibility, but also no influence. Imagine a populist without likes and shares. It would be very hard to uh, have a credible stance of I'm articulating the voice of the people without any visible uh, support, without any media, uh, media content circulating. On that. So successful political discourse and propaganda, this is not only about content, but also about that algorithmic knowledge on how we style and prepare this course for uptake in the digital ecology and uh, the hybrid media system at large. So this is the framework. This is, these are the assumptions and the theories that we start with by looking at uh, content, very specific data. And I hope to make all of this uh, less abstract by zooming in on a very uh, specific uh, case. And now my PowerPoint does not work. Ah, okay, it works. I will take you with me uh, to Belgium. Uh, of course, uh, some biases here. It's uh, the country where I was born and uh, live in. And I will take you uh, first and foremost with me to uh, well, the end of the 80s of the last century uh, and um, the 90s of uh, the 20th century. And at the time, we saw the rise of uh, a political party called uh, Flemish Bloc, an extreme right party, some would call it uh, a radical uh, right populist uh, party, but I think uh, the label extreme right, um, well, sticks uh, to the party. Now, the party um, um, was born in uh, the 70s, uh, but from uh, 1987 onwards up until 2004, it had one electoral victory after the other. In the end, it even became the largest party of Flanders, the Flemish talking uh, part of uh, Belgium, uh, up until 2004 when it was uh, convicted uh, for racism. Now, it's interesting. Uh, if you look at that party, uh, there are classic populists in the sense that uh, their main slogan was, we say what you think. So we got that populist uh, frame and the content was, of course, uh, an extreme right content, uh, radical nationalist, uh, anti-Islam, anti-migration uh, discourses. Uh, and that was 
the platform for their uh, success. Uh, but immediately you will see that, well, there's a problem by looking at populism like that because it looks at populism as solely a political uh, problem or phenomenon, uh, as you wish. Well, I think it's far more productive to see that um, the party not only had that radical discourse, and you see the boxing gloves uh, out of self-defense is the slogan, our own people uh, first, radical right populist logic, but there is more. The party generated at the time uptake of its discourse in a newly developed media landscape at the time. And here uh, some context is needed. And the rise of Flemish bloc uh, was one in symbiotic relationship with uh, mass media at the time. And the 80s of uh, the last century was the time in which the media landscape started to commercialize and the pillarized media disappeared in newspapers. Later on, we got uh, commercial radio. And from 1989 onwards, we also had commercial television, VTM. You see the uh, well, edgy 80s uh, styled logo uh, on your screen. And uh, well, when that channel started and it, it's new uh, news broad, uh, in its uh, first news broadcasting, it started with the price of tomatoes. I don't remember if they've gone up or gone down, uh, but in general, a lot of people uh, laughed with that as a sign of their um, non-professional uh, attitude towards news and so on. Uh, but the journalists uh, of VTM argued in a populist framework, we bring the news that the people care for. And so immediately you see that well, media themselves were communicating about themselves in a populist framework, uh, but what did the people want? Apparently, according to VTM, that was controversial news. Huh? News on uh, criminality, on violence, on migrants, uh, on Islam, integration, and so on and so on. And so, of course, uh, Flemish bloc fit into that uh, world. It, it, it fit like, like a glove. They were at home in those uh, mass media. Now, after their conviction for racism in 2004, uh, the party was reborn as Flemish interest. Similar message, but a, a, a little bit of a, a well, cleaner package, as you can say. But in general, we could say that the cordon sanitaire was still in place. The cordon sanitaire, uh, the fact that most all mainstream uh, political parties refuse to make coalitions uh, with uh, Flemish interest or Flemish uh, bloc. Now, after 2004, what we see happening is that the party is losing um, slowly but surely election after election. And that was a result of competition of a new Flemish nationalist party. I will not discuss it uh, all that much, uh, but we see that uh, by 2014, uh, the party only had 3%, 4% of the votes left uh, in the chamber and around 6% in the Flemish uh, parliament. And to see how uh, deep uh, the party uh, was at the time, you see this tweet. This is the newly elected uh, president of Flemish Bloc in 2014. Uh, the old guard disappeared, Anamans, uh, Philippe de Winter, and so on. They're still in the party, but uh, they uh, left the leading to the new guard. And Tom van Rieke, uh, well, this is his victory tweet. And you immediately see how marginal the party was. Huh? The tweet gets 10 retweets and nine likes. Not immediately. Uh, prove that he's articulating the voice of the people at the time. And the first thing that he does is uh, setting up a renewal of uh, the party. The renewal of the party, first and foremost, ideologically speaking. And ideologically speaking, I'm going to be short about that, uh, as I said, uh, but he looked at the direction of um, identitarianism identitarian uh, ideology uh, at the time uh, was uh, gaining traction all over the world. Uh, and you see it, for instance, in the fact that they, uh, amongst many others, invited Lauren Southern of Rebel Media and after Rebel Media becoming one of the key figures in the global uh, new right or the international old right, uh, depending on uh, which uh, words you choose, but you get the idea, of course. Ideologically, it looked at uh, the so-called populist revolt in 2016. It aligned with uh, Rassemblement 
national in France with uh, Salvini in Italy, FPE, and so on, and so on. Also looked at uh, Trump, a more radical identitarian movements like Generation Identitaire uh, and uh, the alt-right in uh, the United States. Now, at the same time, they also invested in a digital uh, strategy. And that's why you see the bloke on uh, the left uh, there, that guy is Bart Kleist, not that you should uh, remember uh, his name, uh, but he was hired to manage social media of the party. And it's interesting to note that the party at the time had no more than 20,000 likes on Facebook, which even for Flanders is, well, not a big number. It's something, but it's not a lot. And his self-declared goal was then also to build uh, a digital community, to make sure that Flemish interests were back on people's minds. And how would he do that? By engaging, producing engaging content uh, online, on Facebook. And the, the strategy focused first and foremost on uh, Facebook. Now, here you see a collection of the type of messages uh, that they would post uh, between 2014 and 2018. And what we see is, well, non-professional communication and the full use of, uh, well, the new technologies that are available. And the fact that we all have a cell phone and make, can make um, vigilante cell phone movies. Well, lots of those movies would be uploaded, uh, movies of migrants, uh, fighting, uh, rioting, uh, also conspiracy movies uh, were uploaded. Uh, on below you see one uh, video that is uh, uh, censored by uh, Facebook. Why? Because it's a known uh, conspiracy uh, video that is not really uh, true. Uh, but what you see is a kind of a rawness uh, to it, an air of an authentic par les vrais. Um, you see non-classic professional political communication. It looks as if, uh, well, people that are worried about stuff are posting uh, things online. And topic-wise, uh, we would see that these posts deal with uh, classic topics, uh, the same topics that Flemish uh, bloc in the 90s uh, use in relation to commercial media, massive immigration flows, uh, Islamization, escaped uh, illegals, migrants rioting, uh, but also animal rights. And this is important, of course. This is a strategy to build that community, to make and to produce posts that go viral. And how do they do that? By producing posts that spark outrage. That are, and that outrage is visible in all kinds of keywords like hallucinatory, brutally, it's a cover-up, in the focus on violence, danger, misbehavior and uh, criminality. Now, interestingly, if you uh, analyze uh, those posts in detail, you see that many of them come with calls to action. Share this post. Make sure that it can't be covered up. Share it to find the perpetrators. Or comment and give your opinion. React. Send in your movies. These things are relevant, not only because they help construct the idea that they truly articulate the voice of the people. Give us your voice and we're going to uh, bring it to a larger platform, we're going to bring it to parliament, we're going to bring it to mass media. It's not only that, those calls to action also generate attention. They trigger the algorithms. They help to those posts to gain visibility, to be distributed uh, online. And we see all over the world that this is now classic for digital populist online discourse. Cesarino, uh, for instance, uh, analyzed the discourse of Bolsonaro and we saw the same calls to action. So what we see happening is that Flemish interest uses the full possibilities of the hybrid media system. It uses the media logic of Facebook and its stress on attention and engagement, but it also combines it with that older media logic of commercialized legacy media that focuses on controversy, sensation, danger, and even uh, fake news. In the process, the party has managed to build an active digital community, a so-called network public that circulates and hoovers around uh, the many Facebook pages uh, they uh, manage. It's a network that is connected, but also that can be mobilized very fastly through the expressions of sentiment, danger, fear, 
coverage, be mad here. And in that sense, it functioned as a learning environment. It's a learning environment where people learn to talk about certain phenomena, learn to raise their voice, but also learn discursive practices, share, react, uh, and so on and so on. It built an effective public, as Papa Garici would call it, uh, one that assembles around the Facebook page of uh, Flemish interest, and that helps to helps the party to organize effective attunement and propagate effectively charged uh, expressions. Let us now zoom in to that uh, a little bit deeper by, uh, well, tackling one of um, the posts in uh, detail. And, well, it's a series of posts, uh, as you wish. And it starts with uh, this uh, message on Twitter by Wim van Oselaar. Wim van Oselaar is a Flemish interest uh, politician and at eight o'clock in the morning, everybody's uh, online on the train or uh, just arriving at work, he posts uh, this message of the legacy media. Uh, classic uh, mass media logic, uh, Jos uh, Walker uh, from, with the age of uh, 73 uh, was almost beaten to death and a confused Afghan uh, was arrested. This is of course uh, the stuff that, um, well, works for Flemish interests and this is uh, at the heart of their political agenda. See those um, migrants uh, are dangerous and they threaten us and so on. And immediately you can think about uh, words like uh, the white genocide and so on and so on. Now, newspapers post these messages for the same reason that others do it. It generates attention, controversy, people click and, and so on and so on. Small news has become very big in a commercialized uh, media landscape. Not that it's not, uh, important, of course. Now, this generates immediate uptake, 53 reactions, 279 retweets and 537 likes, which were post on Twitter in Flanders. This is quite huge. And we see among the likers and sharers, uh, Tom van Rieke, the president of Flemish interest, but also the president of the Flemish fraction uh, uh, of the party, Chris Janssens, and Rich van Langenhoven, the identitarian, uh, the president of the identitarian movement, Schild and uh, Vriende, and now an independent of the party. Uh, so it is a post that touches upon the heart of their uh, political program. Uh, and again, you get the populist uh, framework. Huh? While elite parties uh, in the days before were so hard on Flemish interest um, militants posting racist things online, they're completely oblivious uh, for the fact that uh, somebody almost got murdered. Then uh, they keep silent. See here the hypocrisy. See here also the fact that our elite is betraying us. You know, our culture is going into decline and so on. So classic extreme right uh, anti-enlightenment uh, discourse. Now, why do I uh, highlight this is, well, you can see how professional uh, the party uh, works because 34 minutes later at 8.34, uh, the party posts uh, this meme, e-flyer, as you wish, if you like older uh, jargon, on uh, their page. And so in 34 minutes, they used uh, something of mainstream media uh, for their own benefit. Uh, and you see that they, uh, well, take an excerpt of uh, the newspaper article. It even uses uh, the logo of the Belang van Limburg, the newspaper that they take it from. Uh, and in that sense, they uh, take, they recontextualize that message, but they use the authority of uh, the legacy media, uh, the truthfulness uh, that is connected to uh, that image of that newspaper, but now for purely political uh, gains for their own. And they paste it on uh, an image uh, that immediately um, generates fear. We see a man in the fog in a wood with a hoodie on. Uh, it comes with danger, people. You should be afraid because, well, those asylum seekers are truly dangerous. And the only solution is to vote Flemish interest because they claim to protect our people. They are truly fighting for our people. Our people are still first there. Again, at the right, you see uh, the content of uh, the status, crucial. The by now traditional uh, use of capitals in uh, the text. Uh, but again, trying to generate 
outreach. Huh? That message is clearly constructed for online engagement. Uh, it, it is a novel fact. It's news and new stuff uh, circulates faster. It points and uses fear and danger, but it also uses the polarized community uh, that is already uh, constructed. Huh? It is that community that will generate and help uh, the circulation of that message. Within the first 45 minutes, it generated 1.1 uh, thousand likes, 292 comments, 291 shares in 45 minutes, which is quite huge. And that is, of course, a result of uh, the classic topic of the party, the fact that the people uh, that follow that page are, uh, well, educated in uh, recognizing it and also knowing what uh, they should do. And to a large extent, this is based on algorithmic knowledge and party discipline. They know how to produce a viral post. They use the affordances of Facebook. They have a network of pages. Huh? 40 local chapters share the post, bringing them to a new audience. But they also use the affordances of Facebook itself, huh? the affordances to gamify uh, their community by using uh, and enabling uh, the top fans uh, facility. The party has over 1,221 top fans, which is quite a lot. And some of them have been top fans for more than five months, meaning some of them have been very active in five months in a row in interacting with all the posts, generating optake for uh, the party. This is classic algorithmic activism. People do this because they care, because they want those messages uh, to circulate, but also that they know what to do. So here you see how they used the full potential of uh, mainstream digital media, Facebook in this uh, type, without much money. The party, uh, you should know in Belgium, uh, po political parties get donations on the basis of their electoral uh, capital, and that was not large. Uh, at the time. And so they build that community by investing in activating people to work for them. That was one strategy. Uh, just before the elections of uh, 2019, uh, we saw that the party also started to invest in communication online, in the sense that they spend money. And in uh, between 2019 and 2020, they invested over 886,000 euros uh, on Facebook ads uh, run through the main uh, page of the party. Uh, and they had an additional budget of 386,000 euros uh, for uh, ads that ran uh, through the page of uh, their president. And so that is uh, the second um, strategy of building that community. And if we then look at uh, the topics of uh, that um, of their ads, uh, we see that their focus is on the same topics uh, that, uh, well, they use for the organic posts. The organic posts have given them the information they need to build and to construct a viral ad, meaning that a viral ad costs less in Facebook uh, than an ad that doesn't do anything. So they use the same topics. The structure of uh, their post is quite similar. They combine text, a telling image, uh, text with uh, the, the classic slogans, hallucinatory, this uh, should stop, do something, and so on. And in many cases, a call to action, a call to action to like uh, their Facebook uh, page. Like if you agree, says, says it in the status, but if you click it, you like the page. So if you, uh, well, care about animal rights, for instance, and you like it, uh, like because you really care about animal, animal rights, you like the page of the party and you help build uh, the community and that is uh, that they are constructing. And that has worked. Face uh, Vlaams Belang. Flemish Interest is now uh, the largest party on uh, Facebook. It has almost uh, 600,000 uh, likes and a bit more followers uh, than that, which is quite huge, of course, and gives them an enormous leverage within uh, the whole hybrid media system and not only on uh, Facebook. Now, I want to uh, discuss another case uh, of uh, that party by zooming in on a petition they started in uh, 2020, in January 2020. Uh, and um, 
you should know that after the elections, we uh, were, as usual in Belgium, uh, not being able to form uh, a government on uh, the federal level. And as a result, the party here, uh, Flemish interest, uh, thought it was a good idea to push for new elections because they, uh, well, fair do quite well in uh, the latest polls and uh, they launched a petition uh, that is uh, well again using the classic populist framework listen to the people new elections sign uh, the petition and it comes with the status uh, a politician who is afraid of elections is like a swimmer uh, who is afraid of water new elections are needed to move forward again stop the games and put pressure on politics sign a petition listen to the people of the so classic frame, listen to the people. We are, of course, a party that listens to the people, that articulates uh, the voice of the people and what do those people want? They want new elections. Now, if nobody would interact with that post, if nobody would sign a petition, it would be very hard to uh, make that claim that they are truly articulating uh, the voice of the people. So they need interaction. They need uh, people signing the post. And so they spend 300 euros on this post. And in the end, it generates a reach of 100,000 uh, views, uh, over seven, almost 7,000 interactions, four, 576 uh, comments, 1.6 uh, shares. And so it generates quite some uh, attention at least. Uh, but this is just the start. And the day afterwards, uh, you would see uh, that uh, Tom van Rieken changes his profile pick uh, to give the campaign more airtime. Uh, but also, uh, we know that collective changes of one profile picks uh, function as uh, mimetic uh, signifiers, as Gerbaude argued, helping to construct that collective identity, helping to shape uh, the effective public into the community. And with some result, because in one day, the petition had 30,000 people signing it. But again, this is still the start. In the next weeks, uh, we see new ads uh, being launched, uh, organic ones, uh, non-ads, uh, but also paid uh, ads. And uh, again, uh, an example from Van Rieke here through his page, uh, new elections question, and they ask you to interact with a yes uh, heart, a no is an angry face. Now, both uh, reactions help to push uh, that message. Again, an illustration of their algorithmic uh, knowledge. They also use uh, posts uh, like this, uh, where they uh, use uh, the face of Carol de Vos, uh, a famous uh, media political scientist, somebody who uh, regularly uh, features in media to explain the political uh, landscape. And apparently he once said that indeed, new elections are becoming an option uh, more and more. They use that quote uh, in order to, uh, well, convince people again to sign that petition. Now, they have spent between 9,000 and almost, um, well, around 11,000 euros and that campaign, which is huge money. For Belgian standards, for such a campaign, this is huge money. And then you ask yourself the question, yeah, but why do they do that? Why do they spend so much money on something that in many cases a petition is and can be considered as slacktivism, kind of slacker activism where you like it and you get you feel good because you have done something, but in reality it does not do much more than that. Well, you could make the argument, uh, well, they do it uh, to steer the information flow within the hybrid media system. And indeed, uh, you would see that uh, Van Rieke, as a president, uh, is invited uh, by uh, Canvas, a part of the public broadcasting company, to talk about new elections. So in that sense, it worked. But, well, does that really... Is it worth uh, so much money? You can question it. And I think uh, the answer is, well, this is only part of the reasons they launch uh, such a campaign. Uh, more important, I think, is uh, the fact that uh, if you go to the website, uh, that's to the people, uh, listen to the people.be, but in Dutch then, of course, uh, you'll uh, see this petition. Almost, uh, they hope to get uh, 85,000 uh, signatures uh, at the time they had already around uh, 75,000, I think. Uh, I think they met their goal right now. But of course, if people sign, they do not just give their signature. They give their name, their last name, their email, their postal code, their birth year, and they agree with mail updates 
hopefully for the party then, and well, agree with the privacy statement. Now, all this is interesting. Why? Well, let us scroll down. If we scroll down the path, uh, to the page of the petition, we see that that petition is made by Nation Builder. Uh, for the people who do not know Nation Builder, Nation Builder is a non-partisan global commercial political engagement platform. It allows the party to database potential voters, volunteers, staffers and party elites. Uh, that database is called the Nation there. Now, that database also allows them to mine, and the platform allows them to mine all social media activity of everyone that is listed in that Nation. And mind, that mind online behavior is then used to allocate a certain political capital to each member of uh, the nation. In turn, that allows them for the gamification of politics by creating a kind of system of rewards to elicit optimal user behavior, according to nation building. It is used to pull supporters up to the ladder of engagement from petition signers to uh, very active online, becoming donors, becoming volunteers and, and uh, leading uh, subgroups online and so on. It gamifies the people. So the underlying goal of that campaign is not just to steer and, and the information flow to make sure that their discourse dominates, but it's also find the datafication and uh, activating that base to identify the leaders and potential leaders around what, which topics and their networks and to seduce them in taking action in the future. If you sign the petition, well, the next step is that you'll uh, get uh, the question to share it online. You will also get an email uh, to, uh, well, thank you, but of course also to push you uh, to go even further. But there's also a third step. Huh? Nation Builder itself gives the example uh, that a user that has shared or uh, sign the petition can also be rewarded by, for instance, free tickets to a certain meeting or a debate and so on, where one can try to, uh, well, convince that person to be more radical in his or her action. So what we see happening is algorithms, the algorithmic nature of uh, mainstream, uh, mainstream digital media is co-constructing political discourse today. And so if you want to understand contemporary politics, activism uh, and propaganda, we should not just look at discourse content ideology, of course, crucial importance, and we should still look at it. But we should also look at the role of the different media, the human actors, the non-human actors in the media field. Huh? Are there bots in play there or not? And the relationship between those actors and technologies, the structure of the media field. In that sense, we should update our understanding of the media field and politics in general, because the success of populist parties is not just to be found in their discourse and ideology, but is at least partially due to their knowledge and use of mainstream digital platforms and specialized platforms like nation building, the program connectivity, uh, systems of personalization, datafication, gamification, uh, the careful analysis of vanity metrics, they help far right parties and others of course, to construct niches, to construct so-called echo chambers, and those create fertile ground for a political and metapolitical uh, battle of these parties. I'm going to leave it here. Uh, thank you all and I hope, uh, well, you enjoyed it. Well, uh, thank you, Iko, um, for this very, very interesting lecture. Um, I see that we still have some time left uh, until the end of this session. Uh, we got a couple of questions in the Q&A session and also have a question of my own. Uh, perhaps um, I will start with a very basic question asked in the Q&A um, section asked by uh, Marie, um, who is asking like uh, very basically just um, you talked about, of course, discourse in, in men, well at several points in your um, in your speech. Eh? Um, what notion of discourse are you actually using? Perhaps it's useful <laughs> to clarify because we're dealing with an audience that comes from very from a lot of different disciplines, of course. Um, I would say the classic one uh, in, in uh, culture studies, in the sense of discursive practices. Um, so, 
more in the sense of Foucault than the, than the limited uh, linguistic one that uh, would uh, focus on anything above uh, a sentence. So uh, truly about, um, let us say, uh, intertextuality between uh, ways of speaking or in another way, uh, conventional ways of speaking that organize conventional ways of uh, behavior. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And then I got another question for you from uh, Jan Krasny, um, who is asking uh, whether, um, uh, well, Vlaams uh, Belang, eh, Flemish interest, uh, is expanding also um, on other networks like Twitter and Instagram, or whether they really limit themselves to selected platforms such as, say, uh, Facebook. Eh? Um, and he's also wondering if so, if they use uh, well, if they're active on several platforms, eh, are their strategies synchronized across these networks or not, or to what extent? Um, so they started by focusing on Facebook. Uh, they're also active on all the other platforms, of course, uh, but the main platform, uh, at least for building that community was Facebook. Uh, today you see of course that they also use Instagram quite a lot, uh, but uh, of course, as always, uh, the medium facilitates uh, different ways of communicating. And you would see that they use Instagram more, uh, well, by uploading movies or by linking um, uh, memes and so on. What is maybe even more interesting is that around the party, uh, you would find all kinds of uh, activists setting up meme pages and so on, making memes for the party. Um, Schilt en Vrienden is an example also of that. And so you get a very large ecosystem of um, different content productions and different actors, but producing all, um, well, the same type of, of types of messages. And you would also see that, for instance, Tom van Grieke would share memes uh, where he features in uh, from obscure meme pages. So you, you get a, a large uh, sphere there, but the heart was Facebook. Uh, now you see it expanding uh, to uh, all the other platforms as well. Okay, um, thank you, Rico. Uh, another question is um, uh, asked by uh, Jack, Coco uh, Castaldi, and he's asking um, uh, how the high number of followers eh, uh, and likes on uh, Facebook compares to the actual votes in local or general elections, but I'm not sure if you're able to answer that question. Um, I think, or my hypothesis uh, for Flemish uh, interest is that most of their followers are real and I need to clarify this. Um, I did lots of research also on Trump and so on and there you saw that a lot of the, uh, the followers on Twitter and Facebook were or fake profiles, uh, part of click farms and so on. Lots of research has also pointed that out. If you look at, uh, and I, I did not check them all but I, I, I selected several thousands uh, of those followers to look if there are now real profiles of not. And if you look at it, it are real Flemish people uh, in the sense that they have names, they have families, uh, they also post about cats and so on and so on. Um, how do they uh, compare to the electoral votes? Well, you see that the rise uh, here uh, is quite parallel. Uh, they are becoming, uh, I think they are the second or the first uh, political party again in Flanders. So the rise at least has some correlation uh, with the rise in uh, electoral capital. Mm -hmm. But I'm a, a simple uh, digital ethnographer in the sense that I do not really work with uh, all kinds of um, uh, tools, uh, digital tools to analyze. I'm um, more of the screenshotting and following uh, and participant observant uh, kind of research. Yeah. I guess um, that uh, that also connects to another question that was asked uh, by, uh, I don't know if I pronounced the name correctly, by uh, Siu Li Ling. Um, and she's asking, uh, or he's asking, I'm, I'm not sure about the gender, um, what the framework is that is being used to analyze the political discourse samples that you're analyzing. Uh, you already mentioned uh, digital ethnography. Um, would, you, would you care to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. I know that, uh, I know you introduced me on as a discourse analysis and I use discourse by, and discourse analysis, but in first instance, I'm uh, an anthropologist. <laughs> uh, 
uh, an ethnographer, meaning that there's no fixed uh, framework. Uh, what my general way of operating is uh, following the data. Uh, and so uh, I start by a problem. I want to know why Flemish interest uh, becomes uh, so big and then I start following them. I have literally thousands of screen screenshots and I'm looking at uptake and circulation. Uh, so if you look at the petition that I followed, well, I did nothing else for two, three weeks than looking at and screenshotting each post that is made, uh, the interactions minute by minute uh, and trying to find out uh, how things work, how they invest uh, in things. And in that sense, I'm uh, well more of a participant observer, uh, but then online, then I'm working with fixed uh, digital programs, uh, for instance, to analyze uh, that discourse. I do not know if that is a very concrete uh, answer on that question, uh, but it's 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 a practice, it's a way of doing, seeing uh, what type of discourse erupts, uh, what type of posts work, uh, looking at the uptake and so on. So it's more uh, an approach uh, than a clear cut framework, like this is now what you have to do. Uh, it's the other way around. We start with the data and depending on what the data shows us, uh, I'm gonna do different things. I'm gonna look at what is necessary to make sense of the data. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I have another question which is, I guess, uh, specifically relevant for, say, the Belgian audience or at least for people familiar with uh, uh, the Belgian political context. It's a question asked by Marie, who is asking uh, whether that other big uh, nationalist party, uh, the, the Flemish, uh, well, the new Flemish alliance, uh, um, who has become a big competitor, you might say, for uh, the Flemish interest, um, also makes use of these same online strategies. Eh? Uh, did they learn from the success of the Vlaams Belang online uh, and adapt their, social, their own social media presence in response? Or is this really a unique type of strategy that we see uh, in, uh, say, uh, this type of uh, uh, populist, uh, far-right uh, extremist uh, parties such as Flemish interest? I would say it's not unique. Uh, on the contrary, I would say that uh, Flemish, uh, the, the Flemish nation, the National Flemish Alliance uh, was the forerunner. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the, the amount of money they spend on Facebook, um, um, the, the, the so-called healthies, uh, the, the army of uh, fans of the party who would, uh, well, shut up criticisms, uh, journalists uh, react online and so on. Uh, that was always there. I think the big switch that happened and the result that Flemish interest uh, is now growing is on the one hand, the, their investment in digital media strategy, uh, their ideology and the changes in that ideology, the, the fact that there's a new uh, face there, uh, but also the fact that the new Flemish alliance, uh, I don't know if I can say this uh, online, but uh, screwed up in the last years and they made all kinds of political uh, mistakes uh, seen from a radical right uh, perspective. Um, think about um, uh, the Marrakesh part and uh, re uh, resigning from uh, the government and making the government fall, uh, not being hard enough on migration, uh, being hard on uh, Schilt en Vrienden, the radical right identitarian movement. And you saw after uh, those events, uh, think also about the corruption scandals of uh, uh, around migration there. And you saw an enormous shift online of fans that used to work for new Flemish aliens that were now working uh, for, and, as, and I'm speaking here about grassroots activists uh, that now started working uh, for Flemish interests. So uh, here you see that it's not only digital, huh? ideology and uh, political uh, reality also plays a role, of course. Okay. Um, thank you, Rico. Uh, I'm just uh, going through some of the other questions. Um, I have a question here, um, uh, which might actually be quite interesting for you to answer as well, as you've been also involved in uh, anti-racist civil society movements and so on. Um, it's a question asked by uh, Valeria Ricci, um, who's um, asking, well, who's noticing that while discussing 
topics uh, to do with, that have to do with algorithmic manipulations and so on uh, to lay people that they quite often doubt that the effect of social media on their own behavior is so serious and important. And she's wondering how you think um, civil society can be alerted and, and educated about this uh, in order to deal with this kind of stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm quite sad that I do not have a complete answer on this. I try to do this for I think seven years and by giving an, an enormous amount of lectures uh, for civil society organizations and you uh, you see that a lot of people are still looking at online media and, and trawling and so on as uh, well the garbage of society and they tend not to look at it as if it is uh, not important and I always compare it to uh, the role of uh, the cafe in the socialist cafe in the socialist party. It is the place where people hang out, form opinions uh, and where uh, at least part of uh, um, the activist energy should be directed to. Not all of it, I think um, some of the reflexes are correct that you need to build a movement from the ground up, uh, but disregarding the impact of digital media I think is problematic and uh, understanding uh, the new ecology is I think crucial and some good stuff uh, has been has well you can see very good stuff online think about somebody like ContraPoints on uh, YouTube for instance well she uses all the same techniques and uh, she uses keywords she uses the keywords of the extreme right in order to target the same audiences but with very different content in order to hopefully uh, have an impact there and to make sure that people uh, see what's wrong with all that uh, propaganda of uh, the extreme right uh, online and so at least part of the investment should be there we should understand Understand that ecology. We should understand what works, and uh, of course, some things are different uh, in the sense that you need quite some conviction to help posts go viral. In the sense that you need to interact quite fastly, <laughs> and of course. It, if you first want to read uh, the full paper of thirty pages before you like it, well, it's gonna going to fall flat on its head. It will not uh, go viral. Uh, so you see that there's part of conviction and trust uh, there, but also, of course, investment in um, new types of activism uh, in beams and so on. Uh, that being said, uh, I think digital media can also be, be very important in constructing the mass movement in itself. Huh? So using digital media in a very different uh, way. Think about the campaign of Bernie Sanders, for instance, well, that use digital media, uh, but in a way to build a mass movement online to organize uh, people uh, offline and online. I think uh, the combination of all those things are quite important. Um, thank you, Igor. Um, I also have um, um, a question here, um, which which has to do also with this online, well, in part perhaps with this online offline thing. Uh, where it's, uh, well, someone asks, um, Jan Krasny asks, uh, what about the counter position in this discourse? And so um, when he was analyzing similar parties, apparently, yeah, similar parties at the political ideological level, uh, he noticed that opponents of that party were quite quite often present on, on the forums and so on. And he's wondering if there is also a kind of counter movement uh, uh, among people expressing like opposing st standpoints in these online activities going, going against all of that stuff. Yes, they do. Uh, but then we have to question how productive uh, they are uh, in the sense that if you would scroll through um, the post of uh, Flemish interest on Facebook, you would see count reactions, but very, very, very rarely. Uh, um, it's quite unique there. You would see it far more on um, posts of uh, identitarian movements and so on. Now, we have we also have to question <laughs> uh, the the impact of those count reactions because, of course, each reaction contributes to pushing the algorithm. And in that sense, helps distributing uh, um, messages out of their own echo chamber. You would see that enormously uh, when they would use controversial uh, memes, uh, where the left would uh, charge and, and react on those memes. But in that sense, help those memes circulate way beyond their original uh, audience. So it's quite difficult uh, to say so. So my first uh, 
point would always be uh, counter voices should first and foremost build their own communities, should build their own uh, environment, uh, should build their own learning uh, environment. Uh, and then the next step would be uh, to react, but then you should react in such a way that it's quite massive. Uh, if you look now at uh, the tweet, for instance, of Donald Trump, well, chances are quite real that the first reaction you will see is highly critical of uh, that president. Uh, and that, of course, means that there is quite some weight behind uh, behind those movements. You cannot do it as an individual, uh, but it should be uh, mass organized. The question then is, do we need to invest so much time in reacting against and especially on their platforms or should we build our own story and i think um, the last thing is is more interesting if you react react in your own wall with your own message uh, with your own uh, um, link or with your own meme and hope to drive traffic uh, to your place and not traffic uh, to uh, the basis online or offline of others Okay, thank you, Rico. Um, I also have a question which somehow connects to it, I think. Um, well, uh, by asked by uh, Luke uh, Skikluna, um, who is asking whether the content which is could be marketable by the party, also, for instance, all of these stories about migration issues, news. Jan, Jan, the line was bad. I didn't hear you. Can you repeat, please? Yeah. So I have a question here asked by uh, Luke uh, Skikluna, uh, who's asking uh, whether the content of uh, Vlaams Plank, the content it distributes about migration issues, new conspiracy theories and so on, uh, uh, also affects the electoral agenda of the party, uh, or is it simply a way of drawing attention to the party's existing platform, uh, which may be disconnected from uh, their actual political agenda? And it's one on one is deeply connected to uh, the platform in itself and uh, the big change uh, with Tom van Grieke was uh, more focus on uh, social issues and more focus on animal rights but you also see that in a party program in itself uh, the question then is uh, uh, to what extent do they mean it um, to give you my apologies a concrete example uh, they ha have adopted the position that the pensions uh, should be raised um, uh, up until 1,500 uh, euros, uh, which is a position they took from uh, the PVDA, the, the, the Socialist Party uh, in Flanders, the most left one in our country. Uh, and the question here is, is this a key item now or not, or is it just uh, being used for electoral um, um, gains? And I would say it's just being used for electoral gains, but of course I cannot prove it. So there you will have a disconnection, but if you would look at the, the hardcore topics, Islamization, migration, uh, nationalism and so on, anti walloon propaganda, you would see that uh, it's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, what they circulate online is quite uh, the same as what they would write in their books and their programs and so on. Uh, uh, maybe one concrete example, if you would look at the book uh, that uh, president wrote in 2016, well, you would see that they um, advocate uh, the theory of the great replacement and white genocide. This is in that book, you would see it in memes, and you would see it in uh, posts on Facebook. It's uh, the same story. Yeah. And that is, of course, uh, thinking about Kenneth Burke, that is uh, key to good propaganda, speaking with one voice. And that is exactly what you see happening the party elites, uh, the militants, uh, the uh, grassroots activists circling uh, around that party, they all speak with the same voice. Okay, thank you, Rico. Well, uh, we're nearing the end of um, this keynote, um, so I'm going to take advantage of my, my own position to, uh, to ask a question of my own. Uh, I think it's a question that will not surprise you, um, because at the end of your presentation, in a very small remark, eh, you mentioned that, um, uh, well, uh, these algorithmic, algorithmic forms of propaganda that you're discussing are part and parcel of what you called uh, a metapolitical battle. And uh, so I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on that notion in the time that we have left to us eh? uh, and explain to us how perhaps what you call metapolitics would differ from classic struggles for hegemony. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Jan. Uh, that's um, 
quite some question. Uh, where do I start? Uh, maybe start by making explicit where I take the term metapolitics from. And of course, that's from uh, La Nouvelle Droite in the 60s of the last century. And in general, when you see uh, literature on metapolitics, uh, it would focus on the role of Alain de Benoit. And Alain de Benoit would uh, define metapolitics as uh, the battle for uh, hegemony, but then uh, from the extreme right. Uh, Gramsciism of uh, the right. And his focus, even in 2000, together when he was writing with Jean Petit, uh, was on the intellectual battle. It should have been uh, about intellectuals producing ideas uh, that would enable changes in society in the long term. Uh, and of course, that, that is a very productive definition, but I think what is more productive is looking at his uh, compagnon uh, de route, at least for some time up until the 80s, uh, Guillaume Fay. And Guillaume Fay wrote uh, a metapolitical dictionary, and there he defines metapolitics uh, in similar ways. It's about that battle uh, for the ideas uh, because politics follows uh, from uh, changes in uh, culture but he immediately adds a criticism uh, to the notion of metapolitics within uh, the new right uh, meaning he says well it's not just about intellectuals you will never make it if you only focus on intellectuals producing ideas uh, gramsci should have taught us, but nobody read Gramsci at La Nouvelle Droite, he said, uh, should have taught us that there should be a deep connection to uh, structures like the political party, uh, the union in the case of the left and so on. And if you look now at, and he stresses the role of media, the circulation of ideas. If you now look at uh, activists at the new right, if you look at uh, people like Daniel Freeberg, uh, the, the um, editor-in-chief of Public publishing house Arctos. Uh, if you would look at Spencer, Richard Spencer in the US, the identitarian movement, Martin Sellner, they all refer to that definition of Guillaume Fay. And they all stress the fact that it should be built not only on intellectuals, but also on activists, on prosumers, on the guy uh, pasting a sticker on a lamppost somewhere, on a guy or a girl posting a meme uh, online so on. And so metapolitics uh, I see as that broad battle uh, for the change of culture in that new media environment. And you see that a movement like Generation Identitaire is, uh, understands that media environment pretty well uh, in the sense that it not only uses uh, offline activism uh, to mediatize that, re-mediatize that online to get a big audience, it's also structuring its movement along the lines of those media and it trains each year all the activists all over Europe uh, to use digital media in a particular way, namely uh, to learn how to reach out. And that is of course the difference. Metapolitics today needs algorithm knowledge. You cannot engage in metapolitics if you do not understand how the algorithms work, uh, if you do not understand how to post stuff that will go uh, viral. And I think that is the big difference. It's not just about content and discourse anymore, uh, ideology and knowledge, but it's also about making sure that your stuff circulates, is visible and has impact. Very good. Thank you very much. So we've reached the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I, I would like to thank you, first of all, for, for yeah, your wonderful lecture, but also for answering that many questions. There are some questions that I was unable to relate to you because of time constraints, but I'm, um, I'm happy that you, um, that you were able to, to answer that many of them. So um, it remains for me to end uh, this session. I hope you will have the time to, to, to enjoy some of the other lectures and some of the other presentations. Right. We'll proceed to a small break now and then we will start with uh, the first uh, panel sessions. So thank you very much, Iko. Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you for having me. And yeah, um, I uh, wish you all the best and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.